Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I cannot uh, extend to you guys enough appreciation uh, for being here and for entertaining my awkward obsession with the Bible and being here three weeks in and out. And so uh, I am truly grateful and honored to be able to do this with you guys. And so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in because we've got a lot to cover. Um, it's not nearly the fire hose of information before. Uh, so don't worry. <laughs> Take your breaths. You're good. Uh, but we will get to uh, some really cool stuff uh, throughout this night as we go forward. So we'll do a quick recap like we did last, uh, last week. Um, will it reach? There it is. Uh, so last week, we uh, talked about word studies, and we looked at how beneficial word studies were and how to, uh, the, the goal ultimately is to find the different meanings of the words. Why did the authors choose the words that they did in the original language? And also, why did the translators translate it to the words that we have now? And so looking into that, and in fact, Pastor Matt actually alluded to that uh, Sunday in his message that we looked up work, eros, and, and there's an aspect of continuing to do so, but also this completion stage of it. And so the only way that you can find that is by doing these word studies and kind of uncovering these things. And so it really gives you a, a, an idea of the multiplicity of words that we have in the scripture and how they can be manipulated in a way for us to understand a little bit better what's going on in the scriptures. And so ultimately the goal is to help us gain uh, understanding towards the original text the dude has his glasses on. Kids these days. Anyways, uh, we also talked about the interpretation process and some barriers that we have to deal with, some things that we have to know and understand. And some of those barriers are things like the individualistic thinking that we have a tendency to have, right? That, that we need to take our understanding of the scripture instead of saying, you go towards y'all. The, this realization that it's not just for me, that it's for us, that it's a community aspect. Um, but we also need to understand the communication barriers that we have to overcome, uh, similar to the tree drawing, right? That we're as part of the same culture, same people, same time, and yet we can't draw a tree the exact same to save our life. And, and that's, a, that's kind of the, the noise barrier that we have to deal with in communication. But we also have to remember that we don't need to read the text like it was written today. We, we need to go back as much as we can towards the original audience, towards the original understanding, and don't read it like it's a text that was written to us today. Um, it, it's not a rule book, right? It's not a systematic theology book. This is a story of God in creation, and, and so we need to read it as such and see how God continues to reveal himself and un, un, understand a little bit more about the attributes of who God is. Um, and, and so all of this gi gives us further insight into the text so that ultimately we can come today and conclude with a theological conclusion of the text that we've been studying. Because th that's the goal ultimately is that as we process through the text, we're, we're gaining all this information so that ultimately when we come to a theological conclusion, we can be fully informed of what's going on. Because Many a times in our easy Bible studies that you can find, you can find these little three-point Bible studies or like the SOAP method and different things like that. And there's, there's a value to them at, 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 at first, but you have to go a little bit deeper. And, and the downfall is, is we'll come to a theological conclusion with those, but it's not always fully informed. A lot of time it's just based off of our perception. And so this is how we can dig deeper in understanding. And so as we move forward today, we're going to continue with the theme that we've been going through, uh, this picture of discipleship that Christ showed us, this walk with me, learn from me, and do what I do. And so today we're going to go into this do what I do and, and begin to learn how the text is going to change our perception and our understanding and, and how we begin to move forward th with this. Uh, and so a question to ask is, how do the scriptures influence us? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a pause here uh, because one of the tendencies that we actually have uh, today is that we have a tendency to rely solely on tradition, and we use a term, uh, apply. We use the term apply. In fact, in, I looked up six Bible studies over this past week, and in all six Bible studies, they had an A as one of the acronyms. Every one of them, the, the A always stood for apply. Um, and, and I don't think that that's bad. But the sad reality of apply is it, it's very individualistic, right? It, it, it's just about me. What am I reading? What am I retaining? What am I growing from? And how does it apply to me? And, and so it's not that it's 
bad, but a lot of times we don't realize how words begin to drive us, how words begin to change our understanding and, and, and drive our focus in, in even just accidentally using it. And so I, I, I think that we've taken uh, this aspect from uh, what it should be, which is a pluralistic uh, multiplicity understanding, and we've created it to where, what does it mean for me? And, and the sad reality is, is, is it kind of comes uh, full circle, especially into our culture, and our culture has shifted to this, what's true for me is true for me, but what's true for you is true for you, and we kind of have this mentality that, that like, my truth and your truth might be different, but they're still perfectly true. And, and there's a dangerous road, especially in the scriptures, that when, when we walk down that that, that road, right? This kind of Burger King mentality, kind of a have it your way application. Um, and, and a lot of times you get this from personalities and, and different aspects. And so uh, like a, a lot of introverts don't want to look at the Great Commission and say that this isn't a command that I need to fulfill or obey because I'm an introvert. And so, you know, God equipped me differently. Well, no, you're an introvert and that's good, but God still calls us to, to live out the Great Commission in our life. It just might look different in how you do that right? It just might look different in how that's applied. And, and so one of the things that we have a tendency to do is to, to run from the hard truths, the hard things. And, and we don't want to change because we want to just feel good. We want to live comfortable. And if the text tells us and calls us to something that's hard or something that, wants, or that changes us, then we kind of begin to step backwards from it. And, and, and then it doesn't apply to me. You know, what is God speaking to me today out of this text? And, and, and I'm not shunning the lingo, we, we really don't have a very good vocabulary with studying the scripture. But I, I want to begin to change our mindset away from apply, which is very similar to like what I would attribute to sunscreen. It's just for me, right? I'm putting the sunscreen on. And so I want to begin to change our, our vocabulary away from apply and towards influence. Think of influence as, as sunglasses, <clears throat> Right? The, the sunglasses literally change how we see everything because the scripture should begin to change how we see everything in this world. And, and so uh, an example of this is, is how do you apply 1 John? If you know 1 John, and, and if you don't, that's okay. 1 John talks all about love, talks about how we love each other, how God loves us, how we love God, how, how we're supposed to share that love that God loves us with towards others. And so every aspect of that is love, but how do you apply God's love, right? That's a unique statement. That's a unique perception. And, and, and you kind of have to dig a little bit awkwardly into it to really unpack what does it mean to actually apply God's love. But a better way to say that would be, how does God's love influence us? How does God's love influence us? How does it influence our perception and our understanding of everything in our lives? And it begins to change our perception because we love only because he first loved us, right? We, we forgive only because he first forgave. We walk in faith because he paved the way. And, and so what it does is it begins to change our perception of everything that we see. Rather than apply it to our skin like sunscreen, it, it, it's like putting on sunglasses, like in Deuteronomy 6, this, this picture of frontlets, right? And it changes our perception of everything that we see. So that God now and his story and his truths and his attributes all are in the frame and the perspective of how we view the world. And that begins to change, if you think about it, what it actually means to love God. What it actually means to love your neighbor as yourself. Because the picture of what Christ showcased for us is that we should die to ourself, right? And we should lovingly even give our lives over to save others. And there's this picture of that in loving your neighbor as yourself. And so what it begins to do is it begins to take the focus off of us and put it back onto the scriptures, back onto God, and back onto the relational mentality that we have with the text. That it doesn't always just apply to us, but it can influence everything that we see. And so the reality that, that in changing this is, is it points to the fact that not all scripture applies to us, but all scripture can influence us. So not all verses will actually apply to us in our lives, but all scripture can influence us. And, and so that's kind of the reality that I want you to have as we move forward. And, and it might seem ticky tack and, and it probably is. I'm probably playing with semantics here, but the goal is to change our perspective. 
The goal is to change our perspective off of ourselves and put it back onto Christ, where we begin to change because of him and his word rather than because of what applies to us and what doesn't. And so that is my my stage prayer, my soapbox that I am on top of right here. But as we continue on, one of the things that, that we desire to do and have desired to do throughout this is to look at the picture behind the text, right? Look at the text behind the text. And so one of the ways uh, to showcase this is, is really to, to look at hidden pictures, right? And so sometimes scripture, there's hidden pictures behind the text. There's, there's other things that the original audience might see that we don't see. And that's some of the aspects of what we're trying to dig into and trying to study. And, and so sometimes we need to dig deep to see what the author's original intent is, to see what the, the original audience would have seen, and so that we can showcase that. And here's two examples of that, right? So on the right, you see a picture. Uh, some of you, I assume, see a rabbit, right? And then some of you probably see a duck, right? And so I, I, the picture is, and the, the reality is, is the text might actually influence us in different ways, right? It, it, that picture is correct. The, the, the scripture text is correct, if that's the image that we're looking at, right? It just might influence us in different ways. And, and so the original audience might have seen a duck every time they look at it, whereas we might see a rabbit every time we look at it. And so going back to try and uncover what the original audience saw what the, the original perception was, gives us this picture of the dynamic nature of scripture, that, that there's a uniqueness inside of it, that, that sometimes we can, can see the same text and walk away influenced completely different. That we can see the exact same thing and walk away influenced completely different. And so on the other one, some of you just see a frog, right? But if you tilt your head ever so slightly to the right, you can also see a horse, the main is the water area. The eye is right there by the leg. The eyes of the frog are the nose of the horse, right? Right? So sometimes you have to actually begin to change your perception and change your angle to begin to unpack and uncover this text. Um, and, and so ultimately, the goal is to see what actually influences us. And so this is a part of the dynamic nature of Scripture, that it's not that everyone finds their own individual truth but more towards how it influenced the original audience and how it influences us today might look different. But it's a part of the same picture, right? So it might influence us differently. It's the same text. It's the same word of God, but it might be shown. It might be lived out a little bit differently than the original audience. And so the goal in studying scripture is not to write a three-point sermon, right? The goal is to see God and realize how he begins to change us into being the men and women that he's called us to be, to seeing how God's word begins to influence our lives and move us forward in these things. And so this, to me, is why learning and studying Bible study tactics is so important. Because you don't need to be a scholar or a theologian or anything like that. You, you just need to be a man or a woman who is passionately chasing after God. And once you get some of these tools, you're going to be able to unpack an immense amount of truth in God's word. And, and yeah, it's going to be hard at first. And yeah, it's going to kind of be, you're going to stumble through it just like every other human being who's ever lived, who followed these, these paths. But the reality is, is once you continue to progress through it, it's going to unpack so much information for you. You're going to be able to see God's word in so many new lights. And, and so this is, this is why we study. This is why I'm so passionate about it is because to me, this is the continual mystery right? This, this is why I love the book of Revelation so much is because it is, it is still a mystery and it is so exciting to read. It's so exciting to go through God's word and unpack these stories because there, there's times where you sit in that, or we sit in that office, like Pastor Matt said, and we started geeking out over the word work, right? That's ridiculous in most people's eyes, right? But, but we were literally sitting, I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's legit. And we're, you know, and we're talking about, it. but anyways, so we were geeking out over it. And, and it, that's one of the exciting things about this is that even when you start meeting with people and start going through this, you're going to unpack so, so much information. And so it's not that somebody needs to direct and lead and guide. And there's always got to be a leader present who's guiding every conversation. You can bring things to the table. 
You can come and see what God has and begin to bring it to the group and bring it to people around you and just encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ to keep moving forward in their faith. Because it's not about what you know, it's about what God is doing in you to change you and to influence the world around you. And so this is why we live uh, for God's influence in our lives, especially through his word. And so as we continue today... um, I want you to remember that the, the original intent, the, the original audience, the, the original everything is the, the ultimate goal for us to try and uncover and discover the text. Always go back. So no matter what you remember in the entire Bible study aspect, always go back to the original audience and the original text. Do whatever you can to go back to the original meeting because the, it might not look the same in how it's lived out, but the same desire and passion and influence that God had for them is the same that he's moving forward with us. It just might look different in how we apply it to our lives in the aspect, in the aspect of acting it out. And, and so this actually is probably one of the downfalls that we have in reading prophecy too, is, is we have a tendency to put ourselves into it. Right? Like we have a tendency to read eschatology, revelation. We're like, oh man, like mountains are going to crumble and, and stars are going to fall out of the sky and tsunamis are going to come and fire is going to happen. And California is on fire half of the year. But fires are going to happen and all these things. And we have a tendency to read ourselves into the text. But the reality is, and what it begins to show through the text and through the scriptures is none of that probably will happen here. Maybe some of it will have aspects of it and residues of it. But the whole text is pointed directly to Israel and the Middle East. So we probably will experience aspects of it if, if it plays out like we think it will and how it reads. But the majority of that is going to happen way across the world. And that's one of the, 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 the downfalls that we have is we try to read ourselves into the text even on accident. And, and so... We're, we're actually good at putting ourselves into the story, but in a negative way, because we put ourselves in the story and then think of how we would get it. Like, what would we pull out of it? Uh, instead of putting ourselves in the story in their shoes, and what would they see? And, and that's kind of what we talked about last week as we kind of ended was this aspect of what does it mean to put yourself in their shoes? What does it, mean, what does it look like to see what they see? And so uh, to ask questions like, uh, what, what is going on here and try and look at it from every angle, from every perspective and, and just try and find what might be missed, right? Like that's what we need to step into and try and find what might be missed because we also have a tendency to read fast, to, to read the text and try and get through it, right? If I'm going to read a chapter at a time, I'm going to finish that chapter. And, and if that's my goal and that's my mentality, sadly, a lot of times we miss things. That's why I've read the book of Daniel five times, and yet I just discovered, reading it a sixth time, that Daniel was uh, titled as light in, the, in Daniel chapter five. So I read it five times through, studied it, you know, dug deep into it, and I still discovered something new as I read it again. So, so the picture is, is that we kind of go a little too fast at times. It's the same with Ezekiel. I've read Ezekiel about three times because of the eschatology aspect of it, and I never caught that Sodom and Gomorrah was poised in there that pointed to that, the reason that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. I read through it. I even had it underlined in one of my Bibles. Didn't even comprehend it. Just saw it. Cool. Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Underlined it. And it never even stuck with me. And so there's a lot of times that we, we, we tend to read a little too fast. And so if we slow down, we get in their shoes, and, and we begin to ask the questions and ask, what, what are they seeing? What are they smelling? Where are they going? What is, what is happening? And, and, and just slow down and perceive what's actually happening. We can begin to test the scriptures. Because the reality is, is what's true will always prove itself true. And God's word, even Jesus said that my word will never return void. That what's true will always come out on top and true. And so we can begin to test the scripture and even ask the hard questions. And I mean, even be willing to ask some very hard questions. Like for instance, in John, if we were created by God intentionally, are we actually created sinful? Not sin nature, but are we created condemned? One of the largest theologies of the day that is continually growing believes that we are created completely condemned. And so this text, if we truly begin to look at it, and if God's perfect, 
and his creation is perfect, and what he does is perfect, then why does he create us completely condemned? And so, see, these are some of the questions that you would get ostracized, and I have been ostracized for asking some of these questions, but these are some of the questions that that we have to ask. This is why I said at the very beginning, we take our theologies, we take our paradigms, all the things that we've been taught and that we know, and we set them off to the side. We don't throw them away. We don't get rid of them. We, we, we gently set them off to the side so that we can come to the scriptures new every time. And when we come to the scriptures new, we're able to ask hard questions. Questions like, in John, can darkness actually master light? If you've lived in this world long enough, you could see that evil sometimes does better than good, right? And, and that's a hard reality that we look at. So, so the question is, can darkness actually master light? Is that even possible? Another one is, is how is the word and God the same but different? This speaks to the hypostatic union, the, tr- the Trinity aspect. And I can tell you this, after studying the Trinity and the hypostatic union for many years, I'm still confused by it. So, do- so don't worry, you're not, this isn't an answer on a test that you're going to have to come up with. But, but these are questions that we have to begin to ask. And so it's not tearing down our beliefs and it's not uh, dissecting things out to where we're, we're destroying our beliefs, but it's coming to the text with real questions to look at the answers and see what God is saying in the text. Or in Deuteronomy, what does it mean that the Lord is one? Uh, how do I actually bind scripture to me? What does that even mean? What, what, is that, what am I supposed to do there? Um, should I really write scripture on the doorposts or in the threshold of my house? Should I actually live that out? And Mark, uh, why did Jesus point to a story where David sinned? Why was that Jesus's illustration, right? You think God and, 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 and his perfection and the holiness and the righteousness, and yet the story that Jesus chose was a story where the person was highlighted sinning. Why would he choose that? Why would, be, why would that be the one that he chose? Right? And so this is where we need to begin to, to kind of dive into that and be willing to ask the hard questions, be willing to dive deep into the scriptures and, and slow down and look at every possible equation and, and, and just see what God reveals, see what God begins to showcase and see how God begins to show up even with these hard questions, even when it goes against the grain of, of our beliefs and our practices and our theology. Because as I said before, What's true will always be true. God will always prove himself true in his word. He always will. Jesus said, my word will never return void. It will never come back without profit. So so there's a reality that we can go to the scripture, even with these hard questions, and see what God reveals. Doesn't mean we're going to get an answer to all the hard questions, but we can at least begin to ask it and search for it. And so as we progress, one of the easiest ways to begin to unravel these texts and unravel kind of these aspects um, to see what God is showing us is by asking the question, is this a command or a conviction? Is this a command or a conviction? And so essentially we go to the text and we say, what does this require of us? Um, And so I have printed some papers for you and some red blue glasses uh, on the table. And so the papers are our scripture, our text. Um, behind our scripture and our text is uh, a picture uh, behind the text that has a similarity of something to do with the text. So in Mark, that picture is actually a picture of the showbread uh, and the showbread table where David would have taken the bread from and he would have eaten the consecrated bread. Um, and in uh, uh, Deuteronomy, let's see, which one I got? Uh, so in Mark, I've got the showbread and wheat. In Deuteronomy, I've got the Torah scroll, and that says uh, Shema in, is, uh, in Hebrew over a uh, shape of Israel. And then in John, I have the handprint, which is uh, one of my favorite images of this because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so handprint is the flesh. Um, but the thing that I want you to see and the uniqueness that I want you to see is the dynamic nature of text is that not only that we can see the text, but we can also begin to see the picture behind the text, right? And, and so one lens, if you close, the, close your one eye, you're going to see out of the red lens, right? And you're going to see all the blue ink. 
And in seeing all the blue ink, what you're going to see is maybe the lens in their time. And then you close the other eye and open up, you know, the, the blue eye, and you'll begin to see all the red ink showcased, and the blue ink is hidden, and that's the lens in our time. And so what I want us to begin to see and remember, and, and when you and please take this home and, and, and just keep this as a remembrance, uh, but, but this begins to showcase to us how the text influenced both, both us and them how it begins to change our perception and our perspective that we don't need to just see it looking through it through our lens, but we need to see the text looking through their lens as well. So uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, we've got 50 words in front of the picture and we've got a thousand words of the picture behind the text. And so we can really begin to uncover and unpack and, and do this kind of interpretive dance as we look through both lenses going back and forth And in doing so, we can begin to see the bigger picture that God is showing us, a bigger picture that becomes revealed. And so I tried to make it 3D. It didn't make it 3D, but, you know, the old school 3D, right? But at least you can see one way or the other and see how it's one is in our time and one is in their time and understand that perspective. Um, and, And so the goal, again, is to try and see through both lenses, try and see in their time and the original audience time and try and see as well as ours. And so one of the things that we begin to ask and and we need to ask is questions like, was this a command or a conviction given to the original audience? To the original audience, as they read this, was this a command or a conviction? Did the original audience see and hear a command from our text? Or was this an aspect of their culture being discussed and displayed or adhered to? Was this an aspect of their culture being showcased, or was this a command given by God? And the second question is, was slash is this a cultural command or a conviction, and is it still applicable today, right? So conviction is individual influence towards lifestyle and decisions. Uh, Things like this are are head coverings, which we'll go over in a minute. Uh, Things like saying the Lord's Prayer. There are practices of people who say that the only prayer that we pray is the Lord's Prayer, because that's what's given in the scriptures. Um, uh, some people are convicted to not have tattoos. I have that conviction, right? Tattoos are evil. And so I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, my mom, she would agree. She would think that I was putting evil on me. Uh, but that's, that's convictions, right? So it's each individually focused and individually seen. A command applies to all God's people directly and from historical past till now. Things like preach the gospel always right? Love your neighbor as yourself, even practicing the Sabbath. And so we have this picture going forward of asking, is this a command or is this a conviction? And this is actually the hard part. We have to realize as we discover God's word, it might find something that convicts us personally to live in such a way that God is calling us, but that might not be a conviction to others, right? So we might get convicted by the scriptures to live a certain way, to act a certain way, to have a certain style or whatever it is, but they can't land on other people. So some convictions can land on us, but are not meant for everyone else. For instance, the the conviction of of practicing uh, festivals or things like Lent, fasting, silence, communion, uh, how often that's practiced by who, all the, you know, all the parameters that we've placed around it. Um, conviction of biblical holidays. There's actually seven biblical holidays found in the scriptures, yet none of them is Christmas and Easter. And so some people are actually convicted to follow biblical holidays. Um, Do we have uh, the conviction of head coverings, uh, our dress, appearance, modesty, what that looks like? I have convictions that I have in my own life. One of my convictions is to actually have these prayer beads. And I, the reason that I have them and, and is for a very specific reason, and I, I, I was struggling at a time, and, and God, I was reading through uh, the faith of Ethiopians and, and how Israel came down, and, and, and they began to worship the Israelite God, and so the Ethiopian nation actually switched over to Judaism uh, somewhere around 4,500 years ago, 5,000 years ago, and, and since then, even after Christ, uh, this is where uh, uh, Thomas and uh, Philip came to proclaim the gospel. And so uh, to the Ethiopians, they became believers in Christ and became believers in Christianity, and they have a thriving community of believers there. And so one of the practices that they have is they wear prayer beads. The reason they wear prayer beads is because they don't want to spend a moment not reminded about God. 
And I was, I was intrigued by that. I was actually convicted by that because I'm horrible at remembering God. Horrible at it. I constantly am distracted by everything else that this world offers. Most of the time, it's my phone and social media, but I am constantly distracted. And so I needed something in my life to remind me about God because I was in a very dark place. And so I bought these prayer beads. They weren't actually prayer beads, but I bought beads and I started wearing them and I started praying to them and it kept being a reminder and it opened up and it began to actually change my life from the dark place that I was in. And and some amazing things began to happen because I kept my focus on God. And so my perception began to change. My perspective began to change. And and so it really began to change me. And so I still, to this day, have a conviction to wear them. Um, I have a conviction to have tassels actually, and we'll, we'll go through that here in a minute. Um, I have a conviction to have a daily Bible study. Um, I feel awful when I don't read. Um, so I have a conviction to do that. I have a conviction to fast, although I'm not good at it. Uh, I have, I have a, a, a lot of other convictions that I have, but none of these convictions can I hold over you. None of these convictions are actually commands. None of these are things that I would tell you, you need to do this because they were given to me by the spirit and they told, and I was convicted by the spirit to actually have these convictions in my life. And so I can't, we can't hold it over each other. We can't hold it over you. And so it's one of those things that we have to dance that fine line of in our interpretation and in our understanding. Is this a command from God that everyone adheres to? Or is this a conviction that God is leading me towards, that leading me in? And so let's dissect some of the scriptures that we have. Uh, Actually, I'm going to choose today. uh, We're going to dissect Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9. So if somebody has that, uh, would they read that for us today? Yes, ma'am. Amen. That's a good, good scripture. All right, so now let's get to the nitty gritty. Is there commands in here or is there convictions in here? And, and let's start by slowly processing through it, okay? And, and I've kind of dissected it into four different aspects. So let's start at the very beginning. Is it a command to see that God is God alone as one or is that a conviction? Is that a command or a conviction? We got one command over here. Is that a command or a conviction? Why is it a command? Why is it a conviction? It's telling you what to do. Okay. What's that? Applies to all of us. Yeah. Is there, this is, this is where kind of the breadcrumbs come in. Is there other scripture that would support this being a command? Is there other scripture to say that there's only one God, that we are to worship one God? Okay. So that, that's a, that's a, a very, not easy way because you got to find the other scripture, but that's an easier way to begin to unpack is this a command or a, a conviction because if it continually showcases as a command, then it's probably a command. But if it doesn't, then it might be a conviction. Okay, so, so we got the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is a command. Now, what about love God with everything that you are? Love, conviction, command. Why would it be a command? Why would it be a conviction? Okay, is there, do we have any other scripture to support it? Where? Who said it? Jesus, right? Jesus quoted. He was asked by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So, so even Jesus says that this is the greatest commandment to love God with everything that we are. Right? So we're following these breadcrumbs, right? Okay. Now, is it a command or a conviction to teach the word of God to your children or in discipleship relationships? Is this a command or a conviction? What, my beautiful wife back there, what did you say? Command. Why is it a command? (laughs) Because he commands it. That's why. 
I, it, I, I would agree. I would agree. Even in the Hebrew text, it has the same connotation. This, this is almost, uh, uh, you can't say forced aspect, but call to action aspect, right? Yeah. So no, I would agree. I think that's a command. Now, the question is, if that's a command, how do we feel about not discipling, right? What if we're not discipling other people? Are we not fulfilling this command in our lives, right? See, the unique thing is that all cultures everywhere forever have taught their children what they know. Think about it. Your parents taught you what they know whether they sat you down and taught you, put you in a classroom and taught you or showed you while they were doing it, they taught you what they know. That's the picture of discipleship that we see in the scriptures. You see it all over the place. Is this aspect of life on life, right? And so this is a command by God that transcends all culture and all time because every culture does this even though they don't even know that they do this. And this is why you get this picture that's not a conviction, but this is actually a command. All right, and then finally, is it a command or a conviction to make a reminder for our hands, frontlets like glasses, or put on our doorposts and thresholds scripture of God? Is this a command or a conviction? Command, why? It says you shall. Right, kind of slap you in the face there, right? So how many of you have scripture written on the doorposts of your house? A whole big zero, right? How many of you got scripture written on your hands? Nope, still nobody. Maybe somebody's got some Bible verse on there, tattooed on there, but right? So what about reminders? How many of you have reminders in your life for scripture, right? Couple, three? See, this is where I think the, the picture of command is not in how it's performed, but the command part is putting reminders in our lives, right? Because a, a reminder for our hands, frontlets for our eyes, this, this aspect of that we see the world through the text, through the scripture, the, this command of putting it on the doors. And, and a perfect picture of this is actually a, a, a book by C.S. Lewis. He, he wrote in 1939, he wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, which is absolutely an amazing book, uh, terrifying at times when you're young and reading it. Um, but it's an amazing book where a demon is actually attacking a child and he's riding back to his demon overlord or commander and he's asking him for advice, and they're talking back and forth. And, and, and so they're going back and forth, and it sounds really weird that a Christian would write this, but it's a phenomenal book. Um, but one of the things that the head commander demon writes back is that we need to make the world so noisy that man cannot hear God. And this is why we need reminders in our lives. It's because the world gets so noisy Everything around us is a constant distraction from our understanding of God, from our influence by God, from, from us even living out what it means to be a believer. We are constantly distracted by it. We're constantly bombarded by noise that surrounds us. I, and even in a, in a literal sense, I, I tell Jenny all the time, when we're going over to people's houses, I'll like, I'll, I'll literally tell her, I'll be like, watch, they're going to be playing music in the background because people hate silence. And guess what? They're always playing music in the background and like nobody can go without a car radio on and oh my gosh, silence is deadly, right? And so it's one of those things that we, whether we volitionally choose it or not, or accidentally, we, we kind of put ourselves into a situation where we put even more noise around us and we get bored sitting on the couch watching TV and playing on a computer. So we pull our phone out and like play on it and we got like digital overload, right? And so... It's one of these pictures and things that we need to begin to see is, is I think the command behind this text is that we need to have reminders in our life. How the reminders are displayed is where it comes into a conviction, right? For him, God is saying to them, culturally, put these binders on your hands, put these binders on your head so you see the front. Let's put this scripture writing on the doorpost. You have another resemblance or, or uh, symbolism that actually goes back to the Exodus where they painted the lamb's blood on the doorpost. And so you see the same imagery that God is using is that this is a house dedicated to the Lord. And so that's the kind of the picture that he's displaying is that we need to have constant reminders about who he is, and to stay focused on him and his word. And so that's what I would encourage you to do as you read that, is to see that it is a command to have reminders. 
What those reminders are, I think, is to our conviction from God and putting in place in our lives. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so as we, as we continue to break down the original tent and see better uh, if it was a command that transcends time or a conviction that was cultural to the day, uh, we begin to see and unpack the truth of what God is trying to reveal to us, right? We begin to see a little bit deeper, a little more clearer picture of, of how do we begin to allow this scripture to influence us. And so all the, although the separation of command and conviction sounds like it, it's an easy task, it, it, it's really one of the harder aspects to figure out, right? It, it's really one of the harder things to try and unpack. And we, we even discovered that even just in this room by saying, some of us saying command, some of us saying conviction, and begin to have to process through, well, why is it this? Why is it that? Why are we choosing this? Why are we going this route? And so um, sadly, this is why there's a lot of arguing in the church. This is why a lot of churches split um, is because they have certain issues and certain things that they believe is commands, which are probably convictions or vice versa, convictions that are probably commands. And, and so we need to slow down, begin to process through this and, and, and essentially ask God, is this a conviction from you given to a few people? Or is this a command from you lived out in everyone's life across all cultures and generations? Is this a command that you're giving us, God, to live out? Or is this a conviction that you want us to live personally in our own life? And so we can glean some of these truths <clears throat> and some of these aspects. And so uh, we'll go down uh, and ask a few more, right? So is the Sabbath, is that a command or a conviction? What do you think? A conviction? Why would you say it's a conviction? Ah, so, okay, so Sabbath was made for man, not man for the, or just made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? But wouldn't that lean more towards a command? No, we meant it was man-made. Well, what is, what, is, what is Jesus pointing out to the Pharisees? That they're being legalistic, right? So he's pointing out that their legalism is what's wrong. Their legalism is a co conviction that they're putting as a command. But the scripture shows us in the rest of text, and we look, follow those breadcrumbs, the Sabbath is actually a command by God. Now, how it's lived out is what begins to change our perception. That's where it comes to conviction, right? I, I follow a rabbi on social media, and he was talking about uh, the, the aspect of Sabbath. And one of the things that they talked about in Sabbath is that the Sabbath and how it's lived out is meant to rejuvenate us. And the second aspect of the Sabbath and how it's lived out is meant for us to not be concerned about finances. So the goal is don't work. Don't try and earn. But if going out and working on a car rejuvenates you, go do that. If going out for a 20-mile run rejuvenates you, you're nuts, but go do that, right? <laughs> like you don't make sense, human speaking. That's ridiculous, but go and do that. And so the, the picture of the Sabbath is that man needs rest. That hasn't changed. God's heart is that man find rest. That hasn't changed. And so the picture of the Sabbath is a command. How it's lived out is the conviction that we, we face. I have Sabbath and celebrate Sabbath on Fridays. We don't work on Fridays. I'm sorry, and I love you all, but I probably won't answer your email on Fridays. Um, I usually become obsolete on Fridays, and, and that's because I desire it, right? Like, like, I don't even do the other side hustle stuff that I really want to do. I don't even do those on Friday. And, and so that's kind of the, 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 the discipline that I've begun to build into my life. Now, what do I do? I don't, I don't, nothing really. Like, I eat chips and watch some TV, and I play a video game every now and then, and then go smoke a cigar because... Why not, right? And so, and so that's how I celebrate. Yeah, because I can, right? So that's how I celebrate the Sabbath. But I also have celebrated the Sabbath numerous times by taking Jenny and Judah and just going walking around stores or going exploring new places. That's also rejuvenating to me. I, Nick loves hiking and, and loves snowboarding and, and snowboarding. Not, my bad, not hiking. He loves four-wheeling. I don't know, right? But but, but that's rejuvenating to him. He might be exhausted afterwards, but it's, at least it's rejuvenating to him. And, and that's a picture of the Sabbath that we need to live out. So what about head coverings? Uh, head coverings is found in 1 Corinthians 11, 4 through 6. It says this. 
It says, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. Right? Jenny, do you feel any conviction over here, young lady? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, I chose that just for her. I love you. Uh, But anyway, so is is head coverings, is this a conviction or a command? A conviction, right? I, I think a perfect example of this conviction is if you read, like we said, compare the scripture to the rest of scripture, right? This is the hermeneutic spiral. Right? So if you read the scripture before this, you see that the imagery that Paul is showing, he says that Christ is man's head and God is Christ's head. And so it's not showing a physical head, but it's showing the symbolism of a head. Now the same goes for this. Could this be a physical head or the symbolism of a head? And so that's when we got to step back and begin to process. But I think the, the thing that sets it over the edge is uh, in the second part of verse 6. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved. Because see, the the verse before that, for if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But then it begins to switch. But if it's a disgrace to have it cut off, well, then she should have a hair on or uh, a head covering on. And so you see this juxtaposition that he's showing even in the culture. He's showcasing that it could be both and. So I don't think it's a command as much as it would be a conviction. And so he's highlighting both aspects of the conviction in the culture. Some will accept a head being shaved, some will not. And so that's where he's highlighting that aspect. And so head coverings, I believe that is a cultural conviction. Uh, Some still practice it today. Uh, I used to know a lady who would put a doily over her head as she prayed. Um, Really weird, but it worked. Uh, What about forgiveness? Is forgiveness a command or a conviction? A command. Why is it a command? right? He did. He did. He told us. He commanded us to forgive. Um, Forgive as we've been forgiven. If we don't forgive, then there's a downfall for us, right? He doesn't forgive. So what about tassels? Tassels on the corners of your garment. Deuteronomy 22, 12 says, make tassels on the four corners of your cloak and wear them. Cultural? Okay. Okay. Why? You think, I mean, it doesn't really mention it any other time in Scripture, really, right? No, I mean, it applies mostly to the priests, doesn't it? Uh, it was all Israelites. all Israelites. And the reason it was on the four corners is really cool because it meant whatever direction you were going and God is leading you. So that's a cool picture being displayed. But, but it was a command for them, but it is, I believe it would be a conviction today. It was a command for them, but I think that became a, a change in culture, when, when culture began to shift and change, I think it became a conviction for us. But it's still, the purpose behind it was a reminder. And so I think that was the command aspect on wearing tassels. Um, what about worship of God alone? Is that a command or? Yes. That'd be horrible if that wasn't a command, right? Um, some other examples uh, that, that you can dig into, that you can discuss Um, Things like uh, women in leadership. What does modesty look like? Uh, Roles of wives and husbands. Roles of pastoral leadership. Uh, Circumcision. uh, Infant baptism. Baptism in general. uh, Communion. How does that look and how that plays out and everything like that. And so there's a lot of, of things that is questionable, command, conviction. And a lot of times people get really worked up over one or the other. Um, but the thing that I want you to see is that not every time you open up the scriptures, is it, is there gonna, are you going to find a command or a conviction? This is just an aspect to double check. Are you being convicted by the spirit to live out a certain way, to live out an aspect? Um, and, and some of these topics that I pointed to are extremely touchy subjects and incredibly fun to talk about uh, in certain situations. Um, and so with certain people, um, but it, it's something that I would, I would encourage you or even challenge you to begin to look into um, because it's not that we need to argue our position and our beliefs. It's that we need to have an account for what we believe. So we just, we need to know why we believe what we believe. It's valuable. 
It's not valuable so that we can condemn other people. It's just valuable for us to have. Well, why do I believe that? Well, I have these reasons why I believe that. I have these reasons why I'm convicted to live this way. I have these reasons to show that this is a command that I'm living out in my life. Um, And so the thing to remember is that commands transcend culture and are applicable to all people. Convictions, however, are a little bit different. Convictions can actually be cultural. Oh, it didn't shift. Boom. There it is. Convictions uh, can actually be cultural. Uh, It can be for a specific people that only they live out and they obey in their circumstance and their time. For instance, I think tassels. I think tassels are a picture of a cultural conviction. Um, Head coverings, tattoos, the fabric of two types sewn together. Um, If you read uh, in Leviticus, you can see that that's one of the laws. That's one of the 613 laws is that don't have two types of clothes sewn together. And there's a very applicable, awesome reason for it. Because when you wash them, one might tear away from the other. It's like profound, right? It just blows your mind that God would even be concerned about your clothes. But he is, right? And so uh, you can have cultural convictions. You can have convictions that can be generational. Um, in that the conviction changes over at times and it adapts differently in different cultural settings, right? So outdoor baptisms. Um, I had a guy tell me that the only place to be baptized was outside in a river, creek, or a pond. And anybody who was baptized inside, I guess, wasn't baptized. And so uh, we stopped having conversation after that. But um, there's, col- there's generational uh, conviction for preaching and teaching. What does preaching and teaching look like? If you go back to the church in Acts... Our church today looks zero like the church in Acts. Zero. Nothing. Preaching and teaching in the church in Acts, they would spend 90 minutes reading the text, and they'd give you 10 minutes of a synopsis of like, hey, maybe go do this with God's word, right? That's kind of what it was. It wasn't breaking down. There was no three-point sermons. There's no worship music being played gently in the background with the piano. There's no light show going on. And so none of what we have in preaching and teaching today looks like it did in the early church. Um, generationally, you have alcohol consumption that changes, right? My great grandpa, alcohol was bad. My grandpa, alcohol was good. My parents, alcohol was bad. My generation, alcohol is good. And so the church just like ebbs and flows back and forth, uh, of, of things like that. Same with clothing and style and, and what does modesty look like? Um, and we've talked about that a little bit before, like things change. And so sometimes convictions can be generational. Sometimes convictions can be gender specific. Um, some convictions can be pointed directly towards men or directly towards women. Lipstick and earrings was only worn by whores. So (laughs) that's bad, but that was a cultural thing, right? And so today it doesn't apply the same thing. Um, uh, don't cut your sideburns. Uh, that's an aspect, uh, that we kind of fail to do because I, you know, trim this up, but also says don't shave your head. And so I'm failing there as well. Uh, don't wear other genders clothing, don't wear head coverings or do wear head coverings. And so you have these gender specified uh, convictions that we have. Uh, Another conviction is individual conviction uh, in that an individual person can find this covering or conviction for them that they themselves want to live out. Um, But it doesn't infringe on other people's beliefs or being able to do this. One of those things is listen to only Christian music. Um, And and as much as I love this and I want to do this, I don't like Christian music that much, Um, but I try to listen to it because other music sucks too. And it like, and so most of the time I end up just listening to nothing. So I actually drive around in silence. Um, But the one thing is, is, is a lot of times for some reason, we, we have this weird desire to condemn each other for our convictions right? Like we, we almost poke fun at each other or tear each other down because like, oh, you know, how dare you only listen to Christian music? Like, well, no, encourage them, right? Like, like be like, dude, that's awesome. Way to go. I wish I could do that. Like encourage them, whether you want to do it or not. We, we, we just have this weird tendency to tear each other down instead of encouraging each other. And so if somebody has an individual conviction, applaud them for it. Right? If they have a conviction to read their Bible every day at such and such time, and you're going to interrupt that by asking them to breakfast, and they say, no, I can't, that's a good thing. That's a conviction, and they're living out what God is calling them to do. And so that's a way that we need to encourage and applaud and and, and push each other forward to live out these convictions. And so somebody says that they only listen to Christian music, give them a high five. 
Whether you listen to it or not doesn't matter. Or whether it's actually good or not doesn't matter. It, it's, it's what they are convicted to do and to live out. Um, and then people have convictions that are just not applicable anymore. Um, ancient convictions that we see throughout the scriptures that are not necessarily applicable anymore um, or don't carry the same connotation or meaning. Um, even though some of them are still practiced, they just, it's a different meaning. So like... Uh, um, uh, I just forgot one. Anyways, I heard my son laughing back there. But uh, so some of these convictions are, are personable, are very personal. Uh, and so we might not know what to do with them. Sometimes we might not know how to live them out. And so begin to just trust what God is leading you to. Begin to trust how God is pouring into you. And when you begin to uncover these aspects of the scripture and you see that that Paul did certain things or Philip did certain things or Daniel did certain things. And you go, man, I, I, I really like that. Like, I want to do something like that. Trust what God is doing in you. Trust that he might be leading you to say, hey, I want you to actually pray to me every morning, right? It's one of the aspects of, of building in these, these habits, these enduring habits that we've been talking about, especially with just one, that we have this alarm on our phone that goes off at one o'clock that says, pray, I've had that so many times in my life, and it's gotten to a point where I literally turn it off in my pocket, knowing what it says, it's still not doing it. And so I have to put things in my life and reminders in my life that are actually obstructive to me doing stuff. And, and, and then I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I should do that. Or, oh, yeah, I should pray. Or, oh, yeah, I should really open my Bible. They, they, make, they make fun of me in the office because I always have my Bible open in front of me on my desk. 90% of the time, I'm not reading it, but I have it there because it's in the way. And so I'm like, okay, I got to move it now to work on this. And then I got to move it back in order to that I actually do my daily reading, my daily Bible study. And so sometimes we're convicted to do certain things and, and we just need to begin to step into that and trust that God is leading us. Um, so the reality is, and, and here's the thing ultimately that we need to see, uh, is that the Bible is written for everyone in every time in every culture. But how it influences us and how it convicts us changes over time. And it changes within us and what God is leading us and how God is moving us and how God is orchestrating us. And so trust the influence of God's word. Trust the influence of the scripture. Trust the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life and in his guidance uh, moving forward. Um, so remember, command is for all people equally stated. Um, salvation, Sabbath, evangelism, baptism, all of these things. It might change, right? Uh, we don't preach, well, street evangelism doesn't do very good now. In the 30s, it was different. That was good. Now it doesn't do it. Now relational evangelism is very valuable. And so even the introverts who don't want to live this evangelism out, they have no excuse now because that's one-on-one. -on -one. Like that's much easier. And you just got to step out and be able to do that. Um, and then conviction is, is for how the Spirit of God has led us to live you know, these different aspects of our lives. Uh, the amount to tithe and what to tithe, our Bible studies, baptisms, modesty, traits of remembrance, written prayers, Ash Wednesday, Christmas, all of these things are cultural convictions that God has led us to that we celebrate and move forward in. So, um, but before we go any further, I, I have a gift for you guys. Um, I... Uh, I love these tassels. Um, and I want to tell you why I love these tassels. Um, I'm going to hand these out. I bought these out of my own pocket and I, and I want you to have these, um, because, uh, the tassel itself is called a tetzit. Uh, and the tetzit to the Jewish people is very valuable because God did command it to them. Right. And so in numbers 15, 37 through 41, it says, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garment with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at so you will remember all the commands the Lord, of the Lord, that you obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord, your God. And so these tassels are a picture of a reminder of God for Israel every day. 
Every day on the corners of their garment, they would have these tassels and they would hang down and it would constantly rub against their leg. It was constantly had to be on their person, had to be on their body. In every direction that they would go, God would lead them and guide them. And that's why it's on the four corners of their tassels. But one of the most unique aspects of it is if you broke it down and you actually saw how these were made, inside of the tetzet, all of these knots, there's actually 613 knots. And each knot represents every one of the commands of God, all 613 commands. And so the picture that God was showing them and the picture that they continued to have as a reminder before them that the law of God goes before them. And not only the law of God, but intertwined is the blue thread, which represents God himself. So not only did the law of God go before them, but God himself went before them. And so we have so many times where we read the scriptures and we think the law is restricted. The law is confining. The law is oppressive. And the reality is for them, the law was comfort in knowing that God loved them and desired to point them towards righteousness. See, we think it binds us and it holds us in and it restricts us. I mean, one of the laws is literally don't have two kinds of fabric sewn together. Because when you wash one, one might shrink and pull away. How is that in a, a, a restrictive law, right? Like that is a concerned father who's going, hey, just to let you know, I don't want your clothes to bust when you're walking out in the desert, right? Like, like there's a concern, a desire, a passion. And so when they saw the law, when they saw the aspect of the law, they saw that it was pointing them towards righteousness. That God was essentially putting barriers up around them and saying, if you stay within this confine, we can continue to have a relationship. I'm giving you the avenue. I'm giving you the path. I'm showing you the way. I'm making it clear so that you can see I desire a relationship with you. And that's exactly what the law shows us, is that God has a passionate desire to have a relationship with us. And this is what it represents to Israel every time that they saw that tassel. It is a reminder of God's passionate, zealous pursuit of us. And that's what it's been a reminder to me, is that God loves us. That God cares about us. That God desires for us to put our hope and our faith and our passion and our desires in him. And it totally represents what God has done in our lives, as well as in the past that we can see generationally, that we can see throughout history, that God is in a passionate pursuit of you and me. And I love these tassels. I love what it represents. I love what it means. And so I, I have this on my keys as a keychain. Uh, I, this other one goes on my backpack. Do whatever you want to with it. If, if it's set it on your desk, if it's hang it off of your mirror, if it's put it on your keys, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Even if it's just like throw it in a drawer because you have something better to remind you about God. I don't care what it is. Find something that reminds you to look towards God. Find something that reminds you to pray. Find something that reminds you that God desires you. That blows my mind. Why? I know me. I suck. I know me. I'm still confused that my wife likes me, and yet God knows me even more, and he still loves me. That's ridiculous. That's irresponsible of God to do, and yet he still loves me, and that's the same thing. You know you. You know your flaws. You know your failures, and yet God is still passionately chasing after you, and so please, Put reminders in your life, put things in your life, whether it's a phone alarm, whether it's a, a stumbling block coming out your door, whether it's a, an annoyance, whatever it is, put something in your life to remind you that God loves you and desires you and desires to be with you. Um, and so I will get off of my podium or my soapbox right there because I just want you all to have a reminder in your life of what God is doing. Numbers yes. Uh, it is Numbers uh, 15, verses 37 through 41. It also says it in Deuteronomy 22, 12. Um, this is also the tassel that the bleeding woman grabbed on Jesus uh, when she touched Jesus' cloak. Um, it's also the tassel that David cut off of King Saul when Saul was relieving himself and David could have killed him. 
This is the tassel. So it's the, it's the same picture going forward. Even Jesus wore these tassels. This is, this is an aspect of remembrance that the Jews still to this day wear. If you see a Hasidic Jew walking around, you'll see that he has the four tassels on. And so it's a constant reminder and a remembrance. So um, yeah, find a reminder, find a remembrance, find something that will continue to point you back uh, to God. Um, so as we move forward, the thing that, that, that we continue to have to remind ourselves and remember is the goal of studying scripture is not information, but transformation, right? The goal of studying the scriptures is, is to gain understanding, to, to, to learn, but it's so much more than that. We, we need to learn. We need to see these things. You're going to find out things in the scriptures that are just going to blow your mind, and it's awesome, and you're going to be able to take that and help other people see that and point that out, and, and so it's good, but if it's not transforming, if it's not changing us, it's not influencing us, then we're not doing it right. We're not living it out the way that God has called us to. So, so it, it's not only informative, but it is truly transformative, and, and so we are going to jump into the, the theological conclusions of the texts and of the scriptures that we've, that we've been studying. Um, I'm going to tell you the theological conclusions that I have written, but I need you to take the time to go home and write them out yourself. Find what God was showing you in the text, because your theological conclusion might not be the same as mine. And the reality is, is that we have to trust the Holy Spirit to guide us in what we're seeing and what we're understanding in all of the things that we're unpacking, because We've, we've seen how to break down the scriptures hermeneutically. We've seen to find words that coincide with each other. We've looked through breadcrumbs. We've studied important words and how to do word studies and dissect them. We've gone down the interpretive journey toned towards the original audience to find the original intent. We've looked to see if this is a command or a conviction to see how this is cross-culturally applicable. Does this apply to people in Asia right now? Does this apply to people in Africa right now? If so, then we're, we're on the right track, right? If it's only an American picture that we're seeing, then we're on the wrong track. We need to go to where it's a world scope. Um, does it coincide with the rest of scripture? Is it, a, is it a way that we can challenge it to the rest of scripture to see if it's on the same course? And this is part of that hermeneutical spiral. And so then we get to this picture of how it begins to influence our personal lives. It begins to transform us into who God wants us to be. And this is where we come to this theological conclusion. And this is essentially what I do when I have a text of scripture that I'm going to preach through. I do everything I can to break things down. And I go through and I do word studies on certain words. And I find different aspects to try and pull out. I try and find whatever scriptures point back to these texts and go through this. And then I come to this point of a theological conclusion. And when I get to that point and I write it out, it's usually just atrocious um, because I'm not eloquent with my words on paper. Uh, but I, I write it out and then I step back and I begin to see how can I take this take the information that I've gathered and begin to use this as a way to teach, right? This is how we begin to write our sermon. Pastor Matt does the exact same thing. <clears throat> if you go through school, it's the exact same process. They begin to walk you down and take you through. You take the scripture, you begin to dissect the scripture, you unpack the scripture, and then you take it and you begin to walk through it. You begin to put it into a sermon, into a message, and you come up with two point, three point, five point. There was a guy who did a hundred point message. Uh, it was a bad message. But you, you, you have these things that you begin to process through and do. But if you don't practice this process and you don't practice coming to this theological conclusion, but you only jump to a commentary, you only jump to whatever I've written, then you're not going to keep that process going. And so I want to challenge you to, you can take mine and write it down and, and see how yours compares to it, but challenge you to try and live this out yourself. Write out your theological conclusion based off of the information that you've gathered. And it might look almost exactly like mine. It might vary slightly. It might be a huge difference. If it's a huge difference, let's talk about it and figure out where you're going with that. But, but begin to try and unpack that and come to these theological conclusions. Um, and so here is the first of my theological conclusions for John 1 through 5. Um, from before creation, Jesus has been united with God in all things and came to be our salvation and light back to God. 
As we've studied and divulged and dug deeper into what the word means and how it's used and how it's highlighted and how it's understood and, and seeing that, that Jesus and God are this comparable aspect, that it's not that they're comparable, but that they're equal, that they're the same, that they're on the same plane, that he was with him in the beginning and all of creation. And, and we have to also see that he was before creation. That Jesus wasn't created in order to be with God on creation, that he was before creation. So there's this picture of eternity past and that Jesus has been united with God in all things. All things were created by him and through him and because of him and through his voice and through his words and through these aspects. And ultimately that he came to be our salvation and ultimately the light that we can have back to God that he became our light back to God. So this is the theological conclusion that I've come up with for John 1. Do you have any questions about it? Anything that I can either clarify or that you would go against it, which is totally okay too. All right? We'll, go, we'll keep going. So second, we have Mark 2. 23 through 28. I said, God's heart is not that the law be restrictive and oppressive, but that it be a display of the freedom we have in his love. The Sabbath was made for man, not the man, not man for Sabbath. The picture that I love here is that the Pharisees came to Jesus and they showcased the restrictive nature of the law. And it's a restrictive nature that they even came up with. Oh, your, your guys are walking too much. Your guys are taking these heads of grain and they're eating too much because they've, they've rubbed off too many husks or holes or whatever it's called. And they've gotten to a point where now they're gathering food instead of just eating what they could. And so they put these restrictions on them and they kept putting these laws on them and it kept tearing them down. And so Jesus showcases the law is not restrictive, nor is it oppressive. We have this tendency and we've believed for so long that Jesus came to overthrow the law. He didn't. He came to fulfill the law. He lived that perfect life that Jesus or that God wanted us to have in that relationship with him. He just did it in obedience where we couldn't. So Jesus didn't come overthrow the law. He didn't come throw it all out and be like, oh, this was a mistake. He came to fulfill the law, to showcase that the law is not restrictive or oppressive, but it's actually a picture of God's freedom and love for us. And then it, it, it'd be a display of freedom that we have in his love. When we truly live in obedience to God's laws, to God's commands, and what he's leading us towards, when we live in obedience to that, we have a perfect relationship with him. Yeah, we sin. Yeah, we stumble. Yeah, we fall. But because of Christ, we have an avenue now to get there. Doesn't mean that you throw all the stuff out and you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in the law. The law is still valuable right? Like we have a tendency to go, all the other laws are horrible, but the 10 commandments are good, right? Those are okay, right? So 603 laws suck, but 10 of them, yeah, that's not bad. But the reality is, is they're all, they all have this picture of a relationship with God. And so that's what we begin to see. And that's what I wanted to point out here. And ultimately I wanted to use Jesus's words himself. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's that for perfect picture that Jesus articulated himself. Do you have any questions for this one? Okay. You guys like my stuff, right? Uh, anyways, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, or Shema. Our lives should be a reminder displayed in reverence towards God and how we approach him and how we share him with the world. The thing that I wanted to showcase is the three different aspects that you see in the text. First is that we have reminders put in our lives. We have something that reminds us of God, whether it's our salvation, whether it's tattoos, whether it's rings, whether it's jewelry, whether it's alarms on our phones, whatever it is, we have reminders put in place that we continue to use to display reverence towards God. We do it because we love God. And when we love God with all our heart, with all our might, with all our strength, with all our soul, we become obsessed with God. I know people who are obsessed with the 49ers. They live, breathe, and they cried Sunday for the 49ers. 
But there's a reality, and I do that with the bears too. I'm not calling anybody out. But, but the reality is, is that we need to actually live in a way that we are obsessed with God, that we love God with every ounce of who we are, that we passionately chase after God with every ounce of who we are. That doesn't mean you always have to have a Bible in front of you reading. It just means that we have to be focused on him in some way and see that his word influences our lives in every way. And so we have to have uh, reminders in our lives and how we approach God and how we share him with the world. The second picture of that, or the third final picture of that is discipleship. It's not only in how we see and perceive God, it's not only in how God changes our perspective to the world and the reminders we put in this place, but it's how we also share that with the world. How we become the avenue, the light that the world begins to see of who Christ is in us that we are an example of people, or uh, that people see of God in our lives. And so this is, this is my theological conclusion here. Do you, does anybody have any questions about this one or concerns or any comments? Okay. So again, the, the, the goal of studying scripture is not information, but Transformation. The goal is that this becomes a daily nutrition for our lives. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. That we take this information and that we begin to pour it into our lives. We begin to eat it. We begin to become nourished off of it. We begin to grow because of it. It begins to change our life and our perspective and our walk and our avenue and everything about us. And in doing so, Sundays become dessert. And we get to come in on Sunday morning and we've studied and we've eaten and we've feasted and we're chomping on meat and we're still chewing on from the day before. And we come in Sunday morning and you have somebody who's done all the cooking for you, who's, who's done all the dissecting for you, who's done all of the work to get it there and is able to just present it to you so that you can take it and just eat it and enjoy it together as a community. That's what this goal is, is that we learn to feed ourselves and move forward. And so our studying of the scripture is so that we can individually grow closer to God. However, it's not our only goal. It's not our only goal, and it should never be our only goal. First Corinthians says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The reality of you studying the scriptures and you studying the word of God more is that you are being built to build others up. That you are being poured into by the spirit of God so that you can begin to pour into others. You can't take this information that you're getting here and you're getting from the word of God and just sit on it. You can't. You're you're going against literally a command that we even saw in there and the picture of what it means to disciple others, to pour into others, to challenge others, to equip others, to move people forward. And one of the things that we have and, and, and I think that we struggle with is that we have a picture of discipleship as this, this teacher follower. This, this rabbi leadership picture, rabbi pupil. And, and I think the scripture actually goes against that. And in fact, I, I think Paul points against that in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says that we are co-workers for Christ. We don't need like leader follower. We don't need rabbi pupil. We don't need somebody who always has this, this answer for everything, who always is on top and always is in charge and all of this stuff. We need to see that the scriptures showcase that it's a follower, follower mentality. That we are men and women who are chasing after God together. The picture of iron sharpening iron is not that one iron is sharper than the other. It's that both are doing the exact same work to sharpen each other. Both are being used to further each other in this and advance each other in this. Paul, when he writes to the people at this church, he literally says that we are co-workers for Christ. I'm not just the guy who planted the church. We all are a part of this moving forward together to see God glorified and made famous in this way. And so we have this tendency to want to to showcase this leadership follower, and, and, and that's just obsolete to what the picture of Scripture shows that we are iron sharpening iron, that we are co-workers for Christ, that, that we need to continue to move forward in discipleship and realizing that it's all about equipping and advancing each other. It's about equipping and advancing each other. And you can be equipped and advanced by people who are at the exact same level as you. My son has taught me things. I can be equipped and advanced even by people who are below us 
who have less understanding and less knowledge because the reality is the same spirit who talks to them talks to us. And we can learn from that. We can grow from that. We can see how that begins to change our lives. And so equipping other people in the truth of God and searching the scriptures to, how, to see how God influences us and changes our world and changes our perspective is incredibly valuable. And if we take all of this information and we do nothing with it, then we are literally sitting on the commands that God has told us to do and doing nothing. We're refusing to step forward in faith. You don't have to be good at articulating things. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the wisdom, all the knowledge, and all the understanding. You don't have to have that in order to disciple other people. You just have to be willing to walk forward with somebody else. You just have to be willing to advance and challenge each other in the truths of God's word. In 2 Timothy uh, 3, 10 through 15 is a perfect example of discipleship and how discipleship actually hasn't changed. It says, you, however, and Paul is talking to Timothy, it says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my endurance, uh, my love, my persecutions, my suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving to being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which you are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this picture in this writing that Paul is writing to Timothy is the exact same picture that we see in Deuteronomy 6. It's the exact same picture that we see. And so over 6,000 years, the picture of discipleship hasn't changed. Nothing's changed about it. Paul says, this is his approach to discipleship. You followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions and sufferings. You've seen how I've lived life in every capacity, in every aspect, my ups and downs, my, my highs and lows, the, the, the vulnerable times where I was bawling my eyes out because this or that happened and the times where I was strong and I was able to challenge you and encourage you and build you up. He said, you've seen every aspect of my life. And yet you haven't run from the faith because you've realized, as we should all realize, that being followers of Christ means that we will have to embrace suffering, that we will have to embrace suffering. Because even when hard things happen and tough times happen, we still have a God who gives us hope. We still have a God who gives us faith. We still have a God who gives us strength. And this is ultimately the picture of discipleship on display. It's not constantly working towards creating lessons or planning events as much it is, as it is helping find a Bible verse that can help and encourage somebody else. It's you doing your daily Bible study and you find this verse and you're like, dude, this is legit. You should hear this. It's about reaching out to them and saying, dude, I don't know why God put you on my heart, but I'm just, I'm praying for you. I don't know why. Or calling somebody and saying, dude, I, I need help doing this. I don't know who else to reach out. I need help, you know, fixing my car. I need help uh, going to the bank. I need help balancing my checkbook. I don't know. I need help with this. And, and it's this picture of life on life that we have. It's also a moment to go outside of your comfort zone and share the failures that you have in life to showcase that that person that you're pouring into and that you're going and doing life with is not alone. That we've all struggled. That we've all failed. That we've all has, have faults. And we show that vulnerability with each other. We begin to see that we're all in the same boat. And this God that we serve is in the same boat with us and he's pushing us forward and he's driving us towards his goal and his desire to be who he has called us to be. If we trust in that. And so the picture of community and of discipleship is a picture of friendship and support and life on life and love with each other so that we can see that this growth that God is pouring into us through his word is a continuation of our lives, that we are truly living this out in relationship with each other, 
that we're not stepping into this and understanding and growing and, and realizing that the knowledge is puffing us up, but it's not actually building us up. It's not furthering God's kingdom. We're just furthering our ego. We're furthering our understanding. And yet God has called us instead, don't, don't do this building this column of, of information in your life. Use it, live it out. Walk along somebody and walk along people and realize that you're both pushing each other forward and sharpening each other as you go. And this is the humble pursuit of discipleship when it's lived out in a life-on-life -life way. And this is the greatest picture is the reason that it's life-on-life -life discipleship and the reason that we can get, continue to move forward is because it's based off of God's word. Deuteronomy 6 says, these words I have commanded you today shall be. This is what it's supposed to be. The words that I've commanded you today shall be written on your heart. They shall be bound around your hands. This is, this is what you're supposed to do with these things. Live these things out. Whether you go to sleep, wake up, walk around, go on drives, whatever you're doing, use it as an opportunity to pour into other people. And so we don't need Bible study books. You don't need a Bible study material. You, don't, you have the book already. You have the book already. And yeah, you're not gonna dissect every aspect of it. And you're not gonna unpack every aspect of it, but that's not the goal. The goal is that you continue to move forward with each other because one of you might find, you know, A and B, but the other one might find C and D and you're just sitting there going, oh man, I didn't see that. Oh, I didn't either. And, and you begin to push each other forward. You begin to share these things. And so share his word, talk about it, teach it diligently, proclaim it, influence, allow it to be the glasses that you see through because the word of God is valuable to us. And if I haven't said it enough, I'm going to continue to say it till I'm blue in the face. But man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. This is the nutrition of our life, is God's word. This is what actually changes us. This is what makes us into the men and women that God has called us to be. It's realizing that his word is there. It's valuable. It's nutritious for our lives. And it changes everything. 2 Timothy, the end of that verse, is, or the verses that we were reading right there, ends with, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Discipleship is life lived in community with its foundations and its interaction based on God's word. It's not about being the perfect leader. It's not about having all the answers. It's not about having it all figured out. It's not about any of that. It is a humble pursuit of God together with somebody else. That's what discipleship is. It's a humble pursuit of God together with somebody else. It's a life-on-life -life picture. And I want to challenge you to step into this relationship. And, 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 and I just want you to look around. Like We have 40-plus people here who, who desire the same thing that you desire, to dig deeper into God's word. So there are 40-plus people here who have a passion for God's word and, and who signed up for this class. And this is a great opportunity for you to grab one of them or two of them and say, let's do this together. Let's meet once a week. Let's meet every other week. Let's meet once a month. Whatever it is, find those other people and just say, let's do this together. Let's study this together. Let's start breaking this down together. Find a book, go chapter by chapter and process through it and see what God begins to uncover. See how God begins to use you to pour into somebody else's life, to sharpen somebody else's life. And we even have some people who are in a group already who have come and, and I love that. And I wanna challenge you to maybe God is growing you outside of that. Maybe God is growing you to further from that, to, to, to branch off from that and to, to step into this on your own. And if you're going to start meeting with somebody, that's phenomenal. Let me know so I can begin to pray for you. I can, I can literally shower you with tons of information and tons of resources because it is so valuable to begin to get into this life-on-life -life relationship, to begin to step into it and realize that you do not need to do this alone, that there are plenty of other people here who are passionately pursuing God just like you and who need the same support just like you. It's a shoulder tap somebody. Start studying God's word one chapter at a time. Take notes, process things with each other, be vulnerable, share, challenge, encourage, and let God's word saturate your life. See what begins to happen. I love God's word because it is absolutely life-changing and it has changed my life in so many different ways. 
And I love discipleship because I was the fat little kid off to the side that nobody wanted to hang out with. And so when some big dude said, hey, I want to start pouring into you. I want you to do a Bible study with me. I was like, somebody's listening to me. I exist. Yeah, dude, I'm on board. And this dude took me in and became my father figure. I literally send him Father's Day gifts because of who he was in my life. Because my dad wasn't there for me in that, but he stepped in place. Whether he wanted to or not, didn't matter. He showed me how valuable God's word is through discipleship. And it changed my life in so many different ways. And that is why I'm so passionate about it and so zealous for it now. Because it is absolutely life-changing. It is absolutely life-changing. You'll find people who have the most introverted personalities who begin to step into these discipleship relationships and they become leaders like nobody ever expected. And it is amazing to see. So it doesn't matter what your personality type is. Doesn't matter what your time schedule is like. Doesn't matter what any of this is. If you have a passion to grow in God, find somebody else who does too and just start growing together doesn't matter how often you meet, doesn't matter what book of the Bible you're going through, doesn't matter how much information you have or how little you have, just start and watch how it begins to change your life. I'm sorry that I got on that soapbox, but I love this stuff. And so I have a couple things to end with. First, I hope and pray you fall in love with God's word. It is, it is truly amazing. It is, it is the only thing on earth that you can study for hundreds of years and still find something new every time you open it. Doesn't mean it always happens, but you can still discover new things constantly as you open it. So fall in love with God's word. And I, uh, second, I hope, that you, I hope and pray that you continue to push forward. Like Zig Ziglar said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you learn to do it well. It's okay to suck at it. It's okay to do it poorly. It's okay to do it badly. It's, it's okay to not have all the answers. It's okay to not know how to lead. It's okay to not know how to disciple and do this together. It's okay to step into that and just try, see what God can do and see how God leads it. And then I pray too that God makes you uncomfortable tonight until you find somebody that you can begin to do life with. Until you find some people that you can be challenged with that you can sharpen iron with, that you can see that we are co-workers for Christ with. I pray that he unsettles you in that. And I pray that you are uncomfortable until you find that person, until you find those people in that relationship. Because the reality is, is knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So let's learn to love each other. Let's learn to push each other forward and spur each other onward towards the kingdom of God. And then one final thing, I hope and pray that you have enjoyed this class. Um, I've been giddy as all get out. I truly, I, I've worked on this for almost seven months and it is incredibly fun and I annoy my coworkers with it and uh, <laughs> mostly my wife with it. Uh, but it, it's, it's something that I'm super passionate about and so I've, I'm truly grateful and honored that, that I was able to bring this to you guys and talk more about this. Um, but uh, if you wouldn't mind pulling out your phones and going to the Catalyst app, uh, on the app page, if you click on the foundations button, there's a four question thing, questionnaire, survey. It's all anonymous, but I, I, I ask you if you'll fill this out. It's real quick. It won't take long, but it'll give us a wealth of information of how we can begin to move forward. Um, because uh, jealously, I want to do this again or something like this, uh, like finding a book of the Bible and like digging into it and being like, this is how you use all this stuff. Um, and, and so that's actually one of the questions on there. Uh, so please fill it out and, and send it in and just, I guess, submit and it'll, it'll come through. So please take, give me two minutes to, or in, and I'll give you two minutes to do that. And then I will pray. And then you guys will uh, be able to go home and eat dinner if you haven't already. And if you don't have the app, you can download it. <laughs> I'll, do my, I'll do my morning announcements. <laughs> download our app on any platform.
And if you think of something else or something more that you wanted to say later, you can email me. Um, or if you have any questions at any point, please email me. I, I, I love helping out with that. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, you can hit us up later. And I'll, I'll send it out as an email, too, because we have a few people who weren't able to make it tonight. So, well, Let me pray real quick while y'all are finishing. And if you wouldn't mind finishing that up for me, those things would be very helpful uh, for me and Pastor Matt moving forward uh, to know what we can what we can do and, and how we can continue to uh, spur you guys on. Um, Father God, I thank you so much, uh, God, that you gave us this chance to gather together. God, I, I, I truly believe that passion inspires passion. And, and I pray to you that, that I was passionate enough to inspire God, that we would fall in love with your word. God, that we wouldn't look at, at your text as something that's complicated and hard and, and hard to understand, but that we would see that it's truly this, this beautiful historical love letter of your continual pursuit of us, of your continual pursuit of all mankind. God, I pray that, that these truths and these, these things that you, you've given us to learn and, and to grow in and these questions to ask and, and how to process through these scriptures to come to these conclusions. God, I pray that, that all of this begins to sink in, that it begins to change us and it changes our perspectives and it changes our understanding so that, that in every way we can read your word and become influenced by your word in every relationship we have and every encounter that we have, that, that we can truly begin to live out this picture of loving you and being obsessed with you with everything that we are and loving our neighbor as ourself, that we can fulfill these, the two greatest commandments. God, that we'd be a light for the world to see you in us. God, I thank you so much for Catalyst. I thank you so much for this church and the opportunity to be here and, and to do this. I thank you so much for everybody who's come. And, and, and I, God, I pray that you bless them immensely in their studies and in studying your word so that they can grow towards you. God, you're an amazing God. You are a God of mystery. You are a God who is not bound by under our understanding. You are not bound by our theologies and our perspective. You are so much bigger and so much greater than we could ever imagine. And God, I pray that that wonder and that mystery continues to drive us towards you and towards your word. And God, I pray that you stir in everyone's heart that they become uncomfortable until they reach out to somebody else to begin to sharpen each other, to begin to grow with one another, to begin to disciple one another and see how you can move us forward in our relationship with you. God, we love you. We praise you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much.